Aaron Holkren, welcome to the show. This is a very exciting show for me specifically because I get to ask questions of, first of all, somebody I really admire and respect and look up to, and I've had the opportunity to do business with. So we have some history and some knowledge of each other of working together. So this is really exciting to me because I haven't gotten a chance to just sit down and you know extract information for, from you. But as I'm watching you, you know, grow and do stuff, I'm just following the exact same thing. So this is a this is a really good one for me, Aaron Holtgren. Welcome to the show. Well, thanks, thanks for having me. Appreciate it, Alex. Excited to chat and uh, share some different things. So I think the first thing, of course, we have to talk about is it would be the elephant in the room, but it's the crocodile in the room. <laughs> yeah, my uh, my alligator. Alligator. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I'm I'm an avid hunter. I like hunting and. Shot an alligator about a year ago and and got it in the office now. So I've got a blank slate or bank blank canvas behind me that uh, the wife keeps yelling at me to decorate. So I hung a hung an alligator. It almost looks like it's like an old National Lampoon, like a joke. You know, the guy in the office with the alligator coming out behind him. Yeah, it definitely comes out of the wall. You're an avid hunter, but professionally, you are. I, I'll I'll say some things, and then I want you to say how you describe it. So you're project sponsor, you're a syndicator, you're a funds allocator, you're a funds manager, you work mainly in real estate, and you move quite a bit of money around and quite a bit of property and have a ton of assets under your management. And you've been incredibly successful financially at this huge gains very quickly, kind of early in your career too, because you're you're not that old. How would you describe all of that whenever people ask you, what do you do for a living? Primarily would describe myself as uh, as a real estate investor, a, a developer, right? We do uh, we do a lot of development, ground up development and, and land subdivision in the office, retail, industrial, multifamily and storage space. I really enjoy complex deals. I, I like tax credit deals, whether it's historic tax credits, new market tax credits, low income housing tax credits. I really, really enjoy the brain damage of tax credits. Done a fair amount of GSA lease deals, ground up, built a social security administration building for, for a GSA, managed some funds, grew a portfolio to around a, just under a half a billion dollars in the last 20 years. So a lot of that back in 2020 and just kind of starting again and, and running it and doing it all over again. So I would primarily just describe myself as a real estate investor and, and developer. As I was really interested in how you've got, you've got one person in your office that mainly takes care of specifically paying bills. Yep. Uh, and that accounts means- payable and receivable, right? So he's doing deposits and that kind of thing. He's also, you know, he's got all the checks and, and all that and he pays bills. We've outsourced all of the, uh, all the cash management, all the financials, all the balance sheet items like uh, booking assets and that kind of thing, and a lot of the general ledger items, but a lot of the functionality of having somebody in the office to be able to cut checks and and do deposits, we still maintain here for sure. See, I, I really like that because it's I've been trying to figure out how much accounting to take in house, how much to leave outsourced, and how to deal with the outsource. So, how do you feel about you've got it all outsourced now? But that means that they're also working on other accounts outside of your company too, right? You know, um, I think we're probably big enough where we've got some dedicated people, but they likely could be working on some outside stuff as well. Did you have the experience um, like I'm having now, where you have so much outsourced, but you're kind of you might be third or fourth whenever you were smaller? Did you ever have that? So I went from an in-house model where we had all accounting in-house. I've moved to a model of outsourcing most of the accounting. Some of it's a product of current market conditions, current demands, especially in the accounting world. There's a lot of work at home and, and that kind of thing. It's It's been good because I've got more more cooks in the kitchen, but they're they're only making one recipe. I've got people just doing financials. I've got folks just working on general Uh, ledger items. So although I've got more people, I've got one person corralling everybody, the head chef dictating and, and, and holding everybody accountable. But we've got lots of different people that may only may only work a couple hours a week but they're doing the same task over and over again. The idea is that we're getting speed to market faster, right? We, we can turn our financials quicker. We can get K-1s out to investors quicker. We can you know, do all these tasks because we've got more folks that are specialized in doing that said task for us. 
so that one person that reports that your direct report that manages that whole specific area for you? Yep. How much time would you say you spend with them either weekly, monthly, however you want to say? An hour or two a week. And what do you what are you mainly going over? Like what they've kind of done in the recent like last week, checking up on what's happening yeah. this next talk week. about uh, cash management. Every business has cash management and, and it's critically important for our operating entities and for the asset entities, right? For all the various assets. We talk about cash management. We also talk about a uh, pipeline. We've got we've got deals that we're buying, we've got deals that we're selling. So we're we're talking about those items. We're also talking about objectives and efficiencies, right? We're always looking for ways to to make a better mousetrap. So um, we spend a fair amount of time each week talking about bottlenecks, ideas to improve bottlenecks and whatnot. And, and we talk about, you know, performance things that, that sh she sees on the various assets. I talk about and ask questions about different items like that. That's the gist of our meeting high level. I mean, we'll, we'll hit on other things sporadically, but that's um, it in a nutshell. I've really grown by watching your relationship also with our uh, mutual friend and mutual business partner, Brent Mott. As I've watched y'all's relationship, I listen to both of y'all, how you talk about each other and how you talk about how y'all work together. And I went out and basically found somebody that had the same dynamic, like you and Brent with the same kind of qualities. I found, I found myself a Brent. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, so how do you go out and when you're building, because we were talking as before we started recording about you've got these teams, groups in your in your organization. How do you kind of set them up? And would you say that that like one hour per week per direct report is about average for like the top of your teams? Probably in line. It really depends on the, the caliber of my direct report when they start working with me, right? Like we were earlier talking about accounting. The, the accounting staff that, that I've got, my direct report, she's very, very experienced and doesn't need a lot of direction. So it, it, it's really based on the individual's need for direction as to how much time I give them, right? Like in our due diligence team and analysis team, pretty, pretty young group. And therefore, I focus a lot more time on cultivating those, those folks, training them, getting them up to speed. Every week, I try to focus on a new topic or item that they maybe are newer to or don't have as much experience with, right? Like maybe maybe one week we talk about phase ones, right? What's a phase one? Why do we get a phase one? What are the parts to a phase one, right? Like everybody's looked at a phase one, but but like what are the meat and potatoes behind it? What do you need to read once you read it? Do you need to dive deeper, right? So we talk about those and I, I kind of try and focus on something different every week to drive creativity, uh, stimulate thought, develop their skills. Uh, yesterday was, we had two term sheets, right? From two different lenders. I, I go to the team, the analysis and due diligence team, and I say, here's these two term sheets. Tell me which bank you would like to go with and why. I, I know which one I like. I'm not going to tell you which one I like. I'm going to ask you guys, both gals, you know, went off. They they ran some analysis. They did their thing. And they both came up with different answers. There wasn't a right answer in this scenario because both term sheets had pros and cons, like most things do. But I, I want to ask them things that stimulate thought and develop them versus me saying, this is the one we're going with. We're still going to go with the one I want to go with. But that kind of thing, I definitely spend more time with folks that need more development and more growth versus more seasoned individuals, if that makes sense at all. Do you have any plan or how has it worked out that you have a spread of more seasoned to more fresh? We hire folks and look for folks that meet our culture versus more if they meet our culture and have to do the job, right? If I find those two things, we're good. I can teach people how to do what I need them to do. So I would say we're probably more heavily focused on less skilled individuals in our core competency, right? Like accounting, that's not my core competency. So I have to get somebody that is fantastic in that sector, right? My legal, yeah. my, my attorney, fantastic at his job. That is his core competency. He's very, very skilled. But in the real estate game, in the sectors we play in our core business, I'd rather hire for culture and competency 
and then this rock star skill individual, if that makes sense at all. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Did we get to a specific, is it like a number of how many people you would say are your direct report? Some kind of, I, I kind of have a feeling of how big your organization is, but I'd like to kind of let you show that. I've got about five direct reports, four or five direct reports. So that's basically five different teams because they all have. Correct. Correct. Yep. Between accounting and legal, uh, HR, uh, analysis, and asset management are basically my teams and the direct reports that we have. Asset management deals more with property management. Sometimes I'll interject myself in there, but I try to let them focus on those kinds of things. So, Do you have your asset management uh, team handle the refis and the and the dispositions too? Absolutely. Absolutely. So they pretty much have it from the time it comes out of closing. Then they're still kind of another level over property management. Yep. They're the ones that are driving rents. They're continuing to help uh, run the you know analysis of where rent's at, what's market rents, whether it's apartments, whether it's storage, uh, whether it's you know office building. They're working with property management and potentially brokers to fill, keep space filled, Mm -hmm. uh, renewals, that kind of thing, for sure. So do you ever break it out to have like revenue management or is that the same? Would you say that that's good to have those two together? You know, right now we've got it uh, uh, together. I I don't know that we'd ever split that in the future. You never know. Do you have property management in-house? We do. You probably got revenue management pretty much built into your property management team. Totally. Do you do any of that with AI or any sort of technology or anything like that? We have lots of AI in our property management for sure. We have a bunch of it now and we're constantly adding more as we find the newest, latest and greatest. A lot of the trends and direction that the market's going is incorporating those tools into the tool chest for sure, especially in revenue management. Back to how I'm I'm copying exactly whenever I saw you doing that with different property management, I got on online property management, I got on investor management, I got on all of even short term property management for the RV parks that we're building and developing, like just following the same thing. We are constantly looking at different tech. Is there any that you have found that's really working out well for you that you kind of want to say or share? You know, um, we are actually going through a complete overhaul of our tech right now. I'll give them a shout out once I've <laughs> played. I, I don't want to give a shout out yet because it's, it's it's new. So, but it, it looks real aggressive. I, I'd love to share more with you once we once we uh, um, we're, we're weeks away from launching new technology. So once that's rolling and and we work out some of the bugs, I'd love to share that with you. Okay, cool. That's pretty exciting. So, yeah. do you say that that's kind of like combining a bunch of different techs all together? We've got uh, one solution that we can plug in lots of different technology from chatbox AI to answer lots of tenant questions, the same on phone service to gate controls and storage facilities to security. It's all kind of coming together to be one platform. Same in accounting. We were working in three different accounting platforms, and I think we're we're pulling that all into one platform, lots of different uh, um, plugins into that accounting software to get us even more efficient. I'm just imagining that I've gone through one transition of one piece of software to upgrade and taking everything that you're doing across your entire business and plugging it all into one dashboard. I mean, it's, it's a dream come true for actually operating it, but getting it to the point where it's actually running. It took me 10 years to get my one, well, five years to get my one automated real estate thing actually happening. Now you're taking all of those of 20 years and plugging them all into one dashboard. Yeah, we're excited. Um, and, uh, it's, it's baby steps though. I mean, we're, we're doing one plugin at the time. Accounting's a little different. That's all I'm gonna flip a switch, but it's a software we've already used and are really comfortable with. So exciting. It's very exciting for us. So have you have you integrated that also on the kind of on the investor side? Because that a lot of that tech sounded like it's more on the property management and dealing with after you already own it. But what about the fundraising and all that side? That side. So we we do have a different we do have a different platform for that. We're not integrating that quite yet. We're, we're trying to manage the amount of uh, new tech. Uh, so we're, we're really working on efficiencies because the investor platforms that we use work really well right now and, and we've had good success with. So that piece we're, we're not quite integrating yet. Let's get back to talking about hunting because you travel and hunt 
and travel. <laughs> and your wife is the most awesome travel photographer, blogger, whatever you want to call it. Y'all, y'all have an awesome, awesome Facebook to follow with all your travel pictures. How many travel, how many trips have you taken in what a year? Uh, in the last year, I think we've taken uh, four trips. But each one is about at least a week. Oh, yeah. I mean, we were uh, we were in uh, Spain for two weeks. We were in New Zealand for three weeks. We were in the UK for uh, two weeks. We did some United States traveling for uh, uh, over a week. And and next year's, next year's uh, uh, Italy, Africa, and then back to Spain. You like Spain? Yeah. It, well, we, we like Spain. It's just there's there's some more hunting to be done there. That's right. So about this hunting, you don't just hunt what most folks would hunt. You fly to New, Ze- to New Zealand and you fly to far off corners of the earth to find these specific hunts, right? Totally. Yep. How do you Love get so it. into it? Um, you know, it's it's a great adrenaline rush. It's a great workout. There's a challenge component to it. You know, that's what drives me. Yeah, it sounds like blends in with the personality, the same sort of I call this the high performance podcast. And so everybody I interview is like you, you know, it's all people at the top of their game who are really putting in the extra effort. So actually speaking of that, I have some specific questions I ask to everybody. So I usually start off with this, but we were having a good time talking. So let's go (laughs) back and say, how would you define just even that word high performance? I think about it in terms of like, uh, um, uh, not necessarily one item, but like multi component, right? Like that you're hitting every, all all angles right some in terms of like your personal relationship i spent a lot of time working on fitness right i was at the gym this morning with with a personal trainer uh, so i spent a lot of time working on me reading books you know I, I read a book a week and spend time working on me i spent a lot of time working on my my relationship with my wife i i, I value that we we uh we talk we go on walks almost every night I spend a lot of time focusing on my business. I'm up early, go to bed late, checking emails, that kind of thing. So I think about it in, in this high performance as this all around, all encompassing lifestyle. It's a lifestyle of looking at all aspects of life, not just my business, not just my personal life, not just my family, not just my spiritual, right? So try to focus on all those things and keep them pulled together and and doing it right. Oh, only all those things, right? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Some days it works better than others. Uh, Some days it does. How did you get kind of started on this journey to where you, how would you kind of track your journey from where you started to where you've gotten to today? I was in high school and my parents bought a house for them to live in. And, and I just thought that the realtor's job was the coolest job in the world because I grew up on the farm. And all I ever knew was you worked hard to make a living. And not that I don't work hard today. It's just a different kind of work hard. Mm-hmm. I, I grew up, you know, doing hog chores and, and cattle chores and, and working with my uncle, re-roofing houses and picking up stuff. And all these things that were just really, really demanding physically. And and I seen this this realtor and I'm like, this is cool. This guy drives around, shows people houses for a living. I, I've never really been a, a residential realtor, but it was a, was a thing that stimulated me to be like, oh, there's something different than just working hard. So I started reading. Um, my parents were pretty shocked when all through high school, they couldn't get me to read a book to to uh, save their lives. And now I'm reading books like, you know, uh, Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And, um, you know, I've got a highlighter and I'm I'm highlighting things and circling things. And then I started reading some real estate books. I was uh, 18 years old and I went into a bank to try to buy a rental house. And The lady, I'll never forget her name. I'm not going to call her out, but uh, basically told me that I I can't do that. And I I didn't understand why. She wouldn't take an application. She wouldn't explain to me why I couldn't buy a house. That kind of pissed me off. When you tell me I can't do something, that drives me to probably do it more. You know, I went out and got my first investor, my dad. And him and I, you know, we flipped a couple houses. We bought some college rental houses. I found another uh, one of my good friends who has passed away today, his dad had sold a company, became an investor of mine, right? Him and I flipped some more houses. He had bought into a real estate development company, 
that wasn't probably doing the greatest. I was originating mortgages at the time and I, it wasn't my favorite thing to do. I was a real estate investor at heart. So him and I kind of stepped in and righted the wrongs in this development firm that he had. And we, we had grown that company from like eight, $10 million in assets back in like 2008 to, you know, when I exited in 2020, it probably had around 400, $450 million in assets. Wow. So that was the journey. It was painstaking at times. Those of you that don't know, eight, nine, and 10 were not fun times to be real estate investors, yeah. especially stepping into a portfolio that wasn't doing great. So it's that persistence and that perseverance, that ability to drive through. I, I always tell people this isn't the hardest business in the world, but the secret sauce is persistence, conservative underwriting, and integrity. You, you, you do those things and generally things go real positive. Hopefully that answered your question, Alex. Oh yeah. Well, that's, those were some really good kind of core values to throw in right there at the end. You just said, if you just follow these three, three things, persistence, yeah. integrity, and consistency, wasn't that the three you gave out? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. We, and actually we talk about our core values quite a bit here at the office, right? I mean, weekly we, we run through our core values, integrity, teamwork, quality, respect, and financial success almost weekly because they're really important to what makes our business go around. Literally weekly, the staff gets asked and they, they all know. So it's it's really important for us to make sure we're asking the right questions and, and instilling those thoughts, even in the staff. Whenever you're addressing the troops, what kind of percentage would you say you talk about more esoteric, woo-woo, core values, and more specifics like, we need to do this exact procedure at this time and do this checklist. We don't really drive a lot of procedure. It's it's probably more 30% on values and that kind of thing and probably 70 on procedural. But we're not big on like driving procedure. I'm more focused on identifying problems. In, in the office, we do after action reviews. Alex, you were in the military. I was in the military. You know, it, it's it's like ingrained in my skull to do an after action review. So like once we get done buying an asset, right, the office knows we're going to do an after action review. We talk about things that went well, or we talk about what was supposed to happen, things that went well, things that didn't go well. And then we talk about like, what are things that we can do to improve the process, right? So now we have, we have group buy-in as we're talking about process improvement and creating a better experience for, for our team, for legal for accounting for the broker on the opposite side of the transaction for the owner on the other side of the transaction all these things and we develop process and procedure together that's something i never took from the military and, and thought about bringing over into civilian life as the debrief and afterwards but hearing you describe it just now i'm like i can't believe i've let that just float on by and not been doing that we sort you of know, we sort of do something similar but having it set out exactly the way you're talking about, that's so incredibly valuable. This is like one of those videos you could sell for hundreds <laughs> of dollars for people to come and learn that one specific technique, that after action review and really planning out the next part. Yeah, you know, um, it's so ingrained that the team does after action reviews now without me driving it because they see the value in it, right? Property management. Because when we do an after action review, we bring everybody in, right? We're, we've got... We've got the asset managers, we've got accounting, we've got legal, we've got property managers, we've got the due diligence team. And we, you know, it's not a finger pointing session, right? We always start out and make sure everybody knows like this isn't, this isn't uh, you did this wrong, you did that wrong. This is a, this is an information gathering. Hey, everybody sees their piece of the pie, right? I talk about if you're a electrician, the biggest piece of the construction project is the electrical. Right. right. If, if you if you pour the concrete, the concrete's the most important piece. So it, same is true when we talk about talk about any process or anything that we do. Right. We accounting thinks their piece is the most important and legal thinks their piece is the most important. Right. So when we when we take this macro look at it and say, hey, everybody, oh, I didn't know that that's why legal was up my butt about this or I didn't know that accounting needed this or it was that important, right? So we get all these things out in the open and we get this realization of versus looking at the micro, now we get to see the macro and, and it's important that everybody 
maybe doesn't they don't have to understand the macro at the same level yourself or I do. But once they, they do see it and they understand it, the buy-in is so much stronger. Yeah, because I've been ha- hitting up against that a, a lot lately. Different members on different parts of my team, I've spent different amounts of time explaining the overall goal, the overall vision, the overall path that we're moving on. And I'll realize that efficiency and I'll be like, oops, I'm way behind with this person. They don't know what we're doing. They're just focused on their one little tiny thing. And then all of a sudden I'm like two or three weeks past them as far as like planning and in my mind, which two, three weeks in an entrepreneur mind, that's, you're like five years back. You're, you're never going to catch up. So I can't just be leaving totally. people behind is what I'm saying. I've got to keep bringing them along. And and as the vision grows, as the vision, you know, kind of like gets more solidified and specific, I tell I tell everybody in the company all that. Well, the the one thing that that I need to focus on more that we've been talking about is the vision, right? Like we're, we do a great job of values, we do a great job of process improvement. But one of the things that that we're looking at, we're focusing on is vision, the why. Like, mm. what is it? Why do we do this? Why does you know, anybody in the organization that's doing one piece of the pie, what is the why on top of just getting a paycheck, right? And that that's one area that we're trying to focus more on and, and explain. For us, it's truly changing lives, right? Because we look at this and, and we have repeat investor after repeat investor after repeat investor. And when we talk to these folks it, over 20 years, I've, I've talked to a ton of our investors and, and they talk about how these projects have have changed their their lives and i'm like okay talk to me about that well if if i wouldn't have met you aaron and i wouldn't have put these dollars into your they, they maybe have a hundred thousand dollars that that or a million dollars and they put a hundred thousand into 10 different projects right i would have probably retired with a million two or a million three leaving it in you know some sweet investment that somebody got them into right now we've over 20 years i've turned that million dollars into two and two and a half now their their entire retirement looks entirely different than it would and and they're to the point now where maybe they're not even touching principal right they're they're literally they're taking the cash flow the pref and that's buying groceries and that's paying the paying the bills and that's you, you know their their fun money that they're going out and they don't even have to touch the principal. And they're saying, man, that has truly changed my life. And, and that's the why. And that's the thing that we're talking about more. And we're trying to insinuate. And we're trying to share these stories because one micro piece of the business isn't talking to Joe Investor, right? Our, our capital market people are or our, our investor relations folks are. But somebody in property management doesn't know that story right so and and that's a feel good thing that make that's that gets people excited so trying to capture those stories and trying to talk about talk about why talk about the vision talk about the things that we do that are that are truly changing people's lives you ever heard that uh, story that kind of relates to this about the the squirrels squirrels are so dedicated to their one little thing that they don't notice anything else happening but they don't have to see because their squirrels are like integrated in, into nature. So they don't have to know the whole plan or whatever, but humans are different. We still can use the same energy of the squirrel to focus on our one task, but we got to know how it's spread out over the entire goal because their entire goal is just to have food in the winter. So everything that they do is completely related to their goal. So if we want to uh, inspire and manage people and even manage our own emotions, it's to keep everything, every single part of what we're doing tied to the actual ultimate goal. You know, kind of full disclosure, we actually have dealings together. We're actually partners on a deal. Yep. And so we got this deal together. What was it? Four years ago? Yeah, about that. I think so. Yeah. And so we got this deal together. We bought this 36 acres over in Hawaii and we've been selling it and we've had some pretty good success with it over the years. But let's talk about at the very beginning, whenever it didn't go great, because actually we bought them. When did we actually close? Like right at the end of 2019, right as COVID was starting, we were actually starting to sell. Yep. And so we had kind of a lull in the beginning, maybe about six months where we real low on sales, barely had anything happening. One of the things that I look back on, like during that time is we didn't have any kind of, we didn't freak out. We just kind of like rolled with it and and kept working at it and kept working at it. And sure enough, we, we came up with a turnaround and we turned it around and had tons of money coming in every month from it. 
So let's talk about that period from your experience, like at the very beginning when things weren't going that great, because you're pretty much what I would call like the lead LP on that deal or the capital allocator. You're the one in charge of the funds side as a funds allocator manager dealing with me over in Hawaii as the sponsor. Let's talk about how did you deal with all that and how did that work out for you? I think one of the fantastic things that we did because our relationship was very immature at that time, like we we didn't know each other very well, right? Yeah. And and there was just a ton of transparency, right? We were talking every week you know, we don't we don't meet weekly anymore because things are going great. At that time, we were talking weekly. We were talking about marketing. We were talking about sales. We were talking about all these things. F- for me, it, it's all about trends. I can get really comfortable as long as things are trending correctly. Yeah, it it took longer than we expected or wanted. Most things do, but but it trended the right way, right? There was never a point where we needed a to have a, you know, a a necktie session or anything like that, because everybody was working toward a common goal. Mm -hmm. We could, we could see that we were moving the the needle, maybe not as fast as we wanted. That's important. Transparency, looking at trends. If if we've got two lots sold and we've got, you know, 34 one week, and then the next week we've got four lots sold and, and eight, and that's important, right? It's important to, to analyze data and look at it. And holistically, when you looked at that deal, didn't really affect the overall deal that much that we wound up being a little slow from the get-go. All in all, real positive. Real positive. So you talked a little bit in there about relationship. Let's talk about, can we talk about like how you set up your relationship with Brent and that, and how that dynamic works between the two of you? Brent has his organization, uh, Bowtie Capital, uh, and Brent's done a fantastic job of, of being a supreme networker, right? He is a, a fantastic networker. We'll find, or he'll find deals too, but we find a lot of deals kind of come together to figure out a, a, a split of things. And he'll focus on more investor relationship, investor management, capital raising, where I'll focus more on uh, deal origination asset management, accounting, separate entities. But uh, we we work on tons and tons of deals together. And it's just been a fantastic relationship. And I mean, when you talk about relationship, he officiated your wedding. So this is not just a yeah. business partnership. This is a relationship. Totally. Totally. Yeah. No, he, he flew uh, across the country t- to officiate the, the wedding, which is is a rather funny wedding vows that he came up with. It was It was fun. Can you share them with us? I haven't heard this. You know, um, I don't remember them anymore, but it, it it was very fitting, and there was a lot of real estate jargon in the, uh, the deal. I think you can look it up on YouTube as like the funniest wedding vows ever, or something like that. M- Mallory can hook you up. It was it was pretty good. Okay, you're trending. <laughs> you got a viral wedding video. <laughs> I love it. So talk about your, we, I really like this about relationships. That's one of the other things I really admire whenever I watch you is the relationships that you foster and that you keep for a long time. So let's talk about the number one relationship. That's your wife, Mallory. Her and I have been together for since uh, 2016. She uh, was the underwriter on a real estate deal that I was doing. The bank came over to tour this project. It was a pretty high profile project in town. She didn't show up to go on the bank tour. So when I seen her walking by, I, I said, Hey, you need to come in and check out the project. Uh, this, this asset was right next door to the bank in downtown Sioux Falls. Her parking garage, she had to walk by the building every day and, and we gave her a tour and we went out on a date and it, it was a fantastic date. We uh, dated for several years. She moved to Texas with me. Uh, We got engaged and then married. And and now she works in our business, right? She she does a lot working with the banks, obviously being an underwriter and and knowing the bank space. Mm -hmm. She's a vice president of capital markets for us and and goes out and and, uh, works on getting term sheets and all that kind of thing from a professional level. She is a huge pug fanatic we've got a, a pug named Clyde who who is uh, uh comes to the office more than many a mascot days. yeah more, more than, than a mascot, mascot. yeah that we call him the boss around here yeah. he uh uh he, he kind of regulates the office and keeps it pretty upbeat and cheery 
it, it's fun. We try to have a lot of fun uh, at the office as well. And she, she does a great job with that. We do uh, um, happy hour every, every Friday and we, we do trivia and she's kind of the, the, uh, the team lead on getting all the trivia questions lined up and it's a lot of fun. She's a fantastic person and we, we have a lot of fun together. Yeah. And you have this, you know, relationship partnership and this uh, business partnership. And I mean, they just are blended perfectly together. I've seen a lot of people with bad on both sides of, you know, don't know anything about each other's business to too much in each other's business. And y'all seem to have this nice little blend. It's almost like separate entities, almost again, like she has her like portion, like you were talking about. How would you say you split up on that um, on the capital market side? Would you split up the debt and the equity part as far as two different people? Or do you try to keep all that together? Um, so it depends on size. Like we, uh, we have that together right now. She does a lot of, a lot of investor relations stuff and reviews subscription agreements and, and handles most of the capital markets. You know, I, I think it, it really depends on, on size. Maybe at some point in time we would split that roll up, but it is very ebb and flow when we're, when that's busy, it's very, very busy. And yes. when that sector is slow, it's, it's, you know, it's between deals together right now, but. The way we talk about the deals is that it's, you know, we're passing the ball on to the next group. So, you know, I got my deal locator, bringing it down the funnel and then tightening it up and bringing it into the analysis. And then to the, we got to choose which ones we're actually even going to produce a pitch deck. And then hopefully within the next year, I'm forming an investment committee. So we'll actually take it before the committee and decide which ones we want to go move on. Yeah, that's a great idea. Have you thought about having a committee or do you, who's your group that you decide on projects with? Yeah, we 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 uh, uh, we have kind of an informal committee. Um, there are other owners to Tango, and we we talk about deals. We talk the deals that we're working on. We talk about pros and cons, and you know, there's a lot of communication back and forth, and and deciding what trajectory, which deals we want to do, uh, and that's kind of our informal committee, right? They they might see something I don't see, and vice versa. So it. More eyes are always better than less. Would that be like a mix of some of your your LPs and some of your GPs kind of all together? Yeah. Yep. We we had looked at we're well, I mean, that's basically how everybody has to start kind of looking at it that way. And then we were trying to figure out as far as putting together a committee and who'd be good to have on there. And I was wondering if you would keep like actually remove the GPs and LPs from the committee and have the committee be just completely agnostic as like a small share or something like that no we, we want really to have the lps to, and gps still in it we we really try to um bring in the most experienced folks right so a lot of our very experienced lps general partners that have a ton of experience i i want to go to people that are going to ask great questions and mm. and stimulate thought and push me right like why this why that and a lot of times i think if you don't go to those folks and went to people that maybe aren't in that business or haven't done business with you might not be as good a fit. You know, it's, it's almost like the bank, right? The bank's picking their senior folks to mm -hmm. be on loan committee. Yeah. The very, very best. Yeah. All right. Well, you've been very generous with your time and I want to respect it. It looks like I've, I just saw the clock. And so I want to start moving into, I got a couple of questions I, I want to ask at the end. So we talked about high performance. We talked about your business. A lot of what you do is you have people come to you and say, I want to invest money with you and you give them back more money than they give you. So how do people contact you if they want to get in touch and invest with you? Best way to get a hold of us is invest at tangocre.com is a great way to get a hold of us. And we love relationships. We love meeting new folks. We really value and respect those relationships. They're the lifeblood of our business. And so you you invest in storage, multifamily, anything else? Medical office, some land development deals, pretty much the core of our business right now. That's uh, I, I always just search for Tango Development and that's how I find you. So here's the last question. We're going to imagine for a minute. Just imagine this is the last time anybody's ever going to see you. This is the last time anybody's ever going to hear anything that you have to say. But you wind up getting this message out to the entire world on this podcast today. Aaron Holkgren, what's your message to the world? Oh, my message to the world is morals, right? Value relationships, love people, put people first, use money, not people. I like that. Use money, not people. Well, thanks for coming on today. It was really great to see you. Thanks to you as well. Appreciate it. Everybody out there in YouTube world, this is Alex Alexander, the High Performers Podcast. Keep being high performing.